evening, uh, wherever you you are. Uh, we're really pleased to have this um, this course uh, actually for the second time, but the first time online. Um, and uh, hopefully, this is uh, going to be um, an okay experience. Uh, I mean, it, it's necessarily not uh, going to be as interactive as if we were all in the same room, but we can uh, try to make some efforts and we're really happy to um, to have your uh, participation. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Christophe Decimo. I, I run a, a lab uh, mainly based at the University of Lausanne and we are obsessed about the topics of uh, this course. Uh, so hopefully we can we can provide you a little bit with our uh, um, our experience um, you know, uh, inferring trees, interpreting them, um, and identifying and relating genes across different species. <clears throat> so the way we are going to run um, this, as you as you could see, there's already um, that that link to a Google Doc. The reason we do the, the question and answers with the Google Doc is that uh, we found that it's easier to keep track of the questions and uh, and, and uh, provide some answers in a bit of an asynchronous way um, with the Google Doc. It doesn't mean that you are not allowed to use the, the chat function if you if you have like some some um, you know small remarks that you'd like to make or um, or you, you have some uh, you'd like to draw a little bit more my attention. Uh, it's possible also to use the chats because uh, I will not be uh, monitoring the, the the Google Doc during the the lecture. However, yeah, as you could hear. Um, um, we will have some uh, teaching assistants uh, who may who may draw my attention or you know might directly answer some of the questions there or might draw my attention if there's something that really um, merits clarification. I suggest that uh, perhaps in the in the first few minutes um, that 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 you uh, if you if you fancy this you know briefly write in the chats um, you know who you are and you know where you're connecting from uh, maybe have a one sentence uh, uh, you know on, on why you're joining the course uh, that 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 will provide also a little bit of a, a sense also to uh, the, the other um, participants you know who, who's joining um, and uh, I'm going to uh, then uh, you know proceed I mean I'm, 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 we can do that in parallel with, with the introduction um, to to this first hour um, yeah, so I think that that's all for kind of like the, uh, the meta business. Um, so for this first, so I, well, maybe the last thing I will say is that uh, divided uh, things, we have now three hours and I've divided uh, um, the, the, the le these lectures into three parts. I hope to uh, I take about 45 minutes for each of the part, which will then leave um, a 15 minutes break at the end of each uh, session during which uh, you, you'll be able to you know, stretch your legs, maybe get uh, hydrated, and uh, if you wish, also interact a little bit with other members of, um, uh, of, this, of this course or other participants, we're, we're going to create some breakout rooms. So this is a little bit how we're going to get organized. Um, the first uh, part now is quite general. We are going to talk about um, our oh, sequence evolved uh, typically along along trees. Um, how to interpret these trees and uh, how to infer them. And it's just a uh, you know it's fairly brief to cover uh, a very uh, big topic. I think many of you will already have um, uh, worked with with trees, uh, but um, you know we think it's a good investment to get a little bit uh, of a peep. Uh, under the hood. So I just want to st start by stressing how pervasive trees are in, uh, in, in, in modern uh, biology. Uh, of course, you know, the tree of life is still something that is, I hope you see my cursor, um, else maybe I will have to, do you, I mean, do you, maybe can, can I get a quick feedback here in the chat? Do you see where I'm pointing at? Um, with the mouse else, I'll, there's probably another way to do that in, in Slack. Oh, in, in, I don't see it. Okay. I don't see that either. Okay, so let me see if there's... Um, okay, that, that may not be possible. Okay, 
Um, well, um, in the upper uh, right part, uh, I'm going to go more or less here. Uh, clockwise, ah, I can point with my, with my finger yeah, over there. It's mirrored uh, up there. The, the tree of life, uh, th this, is, this remain, you know, something that is uh, um, high, of, of very high interest. You may have heard there, there are some initiatives also to keep on sequencing new species. Uh, and they're still part that are uh, not uh, resolved. And so, yeah, you know, kind of Darwin's tree of life um, is, is, remains an important topic, but there are many also other uh, uses of trees um, which you know, some of which are, are depicted here, um, that that are very applied. You know, trying, for instance, yeah, to model lineage trees, uh, host pathogen coevolution, cancer progression, um, which is also an evolutionary process. And we've seen also quite a bit in the news this year how this can also be used uh, for contact tracing uh, in epidemiology. Sometimes, perhaps not uh, to um, to pinpoint definitively a particular transmission route, but perhaps rather to exclude many uh, very unlikely routes. Um, so uh, trees are used uh, across life. Um, um, so as I mentioned earlier, we're going to first uh, discuss a little bit uh, how to interpret the tree. So these parts uh, will hope, hopefully be already quite familiar to many of you. Uh, but, you know, again, I think we, we want to cover this uh, just to make sure that we're all at the same page. Um, and so here, you know, again, please make use of the, of the, the Google Docs if there's anything that, that is unclear and so where we can spend a little bit more time on. Um, okay, so first thing to note, uh, so the phylogenetic trees I used to relate uh, uh, molecular, uh, well, um, DNA molecule, the, the DNA and protein sequences, the biological sequences. And this is, uh, I think it's a natural model for that because of how the DNA divides, right? Uh, it uh, divides, splits into two, and then the two, um, the two copies can take on their, their own destiny and uh, typically they, they diverge then. And, and so a tree um, is uh, usually quite a good model, at least to um, capture the evolutionary history of particular fragments um, of, of DNA. Uh, then things can get a little bit more complicated. Uh, but here in terms of also representation, I've just uh, shown three uh, different representations. There's Carl Wu's uh, iconic uh, three domains of life uh, tree here, which is depicted as, as, as an unrooted tree. So we, we, there's no specification exactly of where the root is. That's why I call it unrooted. And there every branch has, uh, you know, a meaning um, in terms of also of the amount of evolution um, that, um, that is conveyed. Uh, on a particular branch. So if you have a short branch, uh, you have fewer changes at the, at the sequence level, or it could be less time if the, if the tree uh, convey, is calibrated and conveys uh, a certain time. We're going to discuss um, the connection between uh, sequence evolution and time in uh, just a few slides. Uh, but you have other representation. You may have seen this type of representation either here, like uh, in this um, vertical layout, or it could be drawn, this could be also drawn horizontally. It's a very common uh, type of representation. Um, in this type of representation, we um, maybe we have to be mindful that the, um, the branch length that uh, carry some meanings. I mean, in some cases, they might not carry any meaning here. That may just depict actually the, um, the what we call the topology of the tree, which is the order of connections. Um, or it could also depend, and we need to look at the, the fine print, maybe the caption of the figure to know whether the branch length has some meaning. And if they do, that would be here um, the vertical uh, length of the branches. The horizontal 
uh, branches here are just used to space out the tree. So uh, it would have exactly the same semantic meaning if I uh, widened it, um, if I widened, for instance, if, uh, that, that, that branch, uh, which is just used for layout. And it's really here, the vertical branch that, that, that potentially conveys some uh, meaning. Um, and this is uh, also quite a popular representation, which is uh, uh, kind of a circular, uh, circular tree. Uh, these are, okay, in these both cases, they are rooted. You can see it here, the root is in the, in the center, the root is at the top. Um, and um, here again, the, the, the meaningful branch length are here the radial uh, distances. Uh, but the, um, the, the, the length of the, um, in the other direction, I'm not quite sure how to describe that. The angular, uh, maybe, uh, distance are just for layout. In fact, you can see they're all equally spaced. And this has been sometimes a bit of a criticism of these trees in that, you know, sometimes you have uh, kind of closely drawn species that are actually quite distinct. Uh, here, that's maybe very obvious, but in some other cases is, is a bit less obvious. Um, yeah, you cannot see the pointer. Um, this, is, this is a bit of a problem, I think, with this, uh, this representation. So you, um, I, I, may have to, I may have to change the way I share the slides. You know? So here, I thought this would be a good idea because you, you could see both myself and the slide at the same time but perhaps we'll have to go back to the more classical layout so that you can see the pointer, um, which in this case is, is, is perhaps really quite helpful. So let me, let me just uh, change a little bit the way I, I share um, this. So, Okay, can you see my pointer now? Yes, now we can. Now you can, okay. Yes. All right, so we're gonna do it that way. I think it's probably preferable. I, however, now no longer see um, the chat. Well, oh well, you know, we can't, we can't see everything. Uh, <laughs> Must be hidden I've, somewhere. Well, I've got my secondary device here. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for, I see uh, plenty of feedback. Well, thank you for all of your feedback. Um, yeah, so the angular distance here is not really meaningful. Um, okay, but really the key takeaway here is that when you see a tree, you have to ask yourself, okay, first of all, um, you know, the, what is always conveyed by any tree is the topology. So the orders of branch branches on the tree, you know, here the fact that um, if we go now back in time, uh, the chimp and the human have a common ancestor um, first, they coalesce first, and then, uh, sorry, then you go back to the common ancestor of, um, uh, of that um, common ancestor and the gorilla. So this is the branching order. All the trees will convey this. And then you have to ask yourself, okay, do you also have uh, the branch length that I conveyed? And sometimes even if you have a, a rooted representation, such as this one or that one, um, the root is not really meaningful. I, we will discuss this also later. The programs uh, used to infer trees, they typically can't infer the roots. So it may be quite an arbitrary root. Um, on, but in some other cases, there's a, there's a meaningful analysis that is attempting to ascribe a root to the tree. Um, and so that, even if you have a rooted representation, you've got to be a bit cautious sometimes in your interpretation thinking, oh, is this actually really, um, I mean, did the, whoever produced this, this figure really intended to uh, make a, a claim, you know, that that's their, you know, best roots, uh, most likely roots. Um, okay. So I think that, that's enough for this slide. If you have more questions, you know, ask me um, later, we're going to revisit this. Uh, I ask this in the ask your question in, in, in the Google Doc. So again, you know, one at the beginning we're just familiarizing ourselves with this representation. 
they could be rooted or unrooted is against. It's a bit of an unusual uh, type of representation here for an unrooted tree. Uh, but you know that 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 also works and and um, um, and again in this case the the horizontal line would be meaningful in terms of the evolution distance if this is conveyed at all. So now I'm coming maybe to already this is a little bit bridging um, and the, the, the questions about you know how to infer trees. Uh, we need to get a little bit uh, more familiar with you know the complexity of trees. And so I'm starting a little bit with a with a question that uh, hopefully will 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 um, set some thoughts in 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 motions here. Um, and so for the first question I have is if we are just considering um, a fully binary tree, so every split um, only ever has one incoming edge and then two outgoing edges. Um, how many branches uh, do we have? If, um, let's say, for instance, if we have three uh, leaves. So I have a little question for that. So we, this is uh, one uh, small interactive part I have here. Um, so you have the link um, in the, in the um, if you want to answer this question, um, which is here uh, provided in the Google Doc. Uh, maybe someone can paste it also in the chat. Uh, it's a wooklab.com uh, link uh, in the schedule. Um, and um, so I can open the question now. Sorry. I'm going to start this with this first question, which is how many branches are there in an unrooted binary tree with three leaves? So try maybe if you have some pen and paper in front of you. Um, you can, yeah, and for wooklab, you see the code is SIBCG1, like for day one. Um, if you have a, a piece of paper, you could try to draw this. Uh, if you have three leaves and you have an unrooted binary tree, how many branches will you have in your tree? So please go ahead and, and, and answer. Okay, I see some answers starting to come. Okay, and I, I guess I'll probably also try to draw things a little bit. Okay, just just have to don't be shy. It's also quite helpful for me to get a sense of um, your your familiarity with 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 this uh, with this data structure. Okay, so far I see uh, six answers. If you don't understand the question. Feel free to uh, to ask some clarification. Um, I would recommend, uh, yeah, either on the Google Doc or the chat. Uh -huh. Someone ventures n minus one guess. Um, okay. You are muted. We, we cannot hear you. Oh, thank you very much. I don't know how come uh, I got muted. Maybe when I switch device, I get automatically muted. Okay. What, what I was explaining is that, you know, if may, you know, if we start with the three three leaves, you know, this is one way to connect them, and then here you would have three uh, internal branches, three branches. Uh, so those of you who answered three, you're in, you're in you're you're in good shape. 
Now you might ask, uh, well, is there maybe a different way to connect that? Uh, so let me just go back here. And, and so you might think, well, you know, can you get away, for instance, with just two, uh, you know, two internal branches? Uh, but that I would argue in this case, this is not, this, this one is not a leaf, right? This is an internal node. Okay. And so perhaps you might wonder, well, yeah, well but what, what about, what about if this is, this is just like so short? Right? that it's not quite an internal node, then uh, uh, we have three leaves and don't we just have two branches? Well, actually we don't have two branches we have here. We need to zoom in here, but, uh, but really here we have that third branch, which is just very, very short. Okay, so the, all of you uh, who answered three branches um, are correct, okay? Uh, we have for an unrooted tree, um, of unrooted binary tree with uh, uh, three leaves, you have three internal branches. Um, okay, if, if this is not obvious to you or now clear to you, then uh, you know, uh, you still have some question, you could, you could ask them in, in the Google Doc. And, but I'm going to move then to the next question, which is, uh, how about four? So let me see, how can I, how can I stop this? Um, let me, Okay, I'm gonna get to the second one. Um, all right, do you see the second question? So how many branches are there now for an unrooted binary tree with four leaves? So imagine now you, you have one more leaf. Yeah, all right. Let's see. Some answers already, four, five. Okay, this seems still to be, uh, the four and five are almost evenly, evenly split. Don't wanna influence you too much. Uh, right. ah, okay, well, you have to draw this, draw this tree on a piece of paper to convince yourself. Um, okay, so far the only, answers I see are either four or five, but that's quite evenly split. So, um, so I, I think if you look at the tree, I mean, one way to, to try to, to uh, answer this question is to, to grow our tree. So we, we start from what we, we had before, and we're going to add one more, uh, one more uh, leaf. Okay. And now you have to ask yourself, okay, Oh, let me just see. you see my screen. Yes, we have. So now I need to connect it somewhere. So can I can pick a branch where I'm going to connect it to. So I'm going to pick this branch, for instance. And now if we count, we have one, two, three, four, and five, five branches. What happened is that we add, we had to add one branch to connect, but then in so doing, we divided an existing branch into two. Okay. That's a bit of a, it's not that, you know, if this is A, B, C, D, a more common representation now would be like to have rough, you know, a kind of a more balanced layout. And maybe we'll, we'll draw this like this, A, B, C, and D. This is the same, this is the same topology. And maybe I've, I've, you've seen, I've swapped actually A and B, uh, but that is also okay. It's just, I'm just explaining, I'm just uh, conveying how I, I've connected these four, these four leaves. So you see that by adding one uh, leaf, we increase by two the number of branches. So now this is good to know. So it's roughly, there's roughly twice as many uh, branches as we have uh, leaves. Uh, and it's not exactly twice as you can see, because when we have uh, three leaves, we have got three. But every time we add one, we're going to add uh, one leaf, we're going to add two branches. Um, okay, so that's fantastic. Um, we have our, actually, you know, so the formula, it's, it's um, clear this. It, I'm going to show this later in the, in, the, um, uh, in, the, in the slide, but it's essentially 2n minus 3. And you can see this works for three, you know, if you plug in three for n, you've got six minus three, that's three, that's fine. And then it's going to grow, you know, every time n increased by one, you're going to add another two. So 
this is this is the formula. I mean, the formula is not that important, but the important bit here is that the growth is linear in the number of 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 leaves. So, if, for instance, we want to estimate the length of this branch length, if we add some more taxa, uh, that part, uh, is, and we, if we know how they are connected, uh, actually, we it's not such a difficult problem because the number of of branches doesn't explode. Okay, but now how about the number of topologies? So how many ways do we have now uh, to connect our, um, our, for instance, our three taxa, okay? So I had A, B, and C here. So how many ways can we, um, how many topologies do we have uh, with A, B, and C? <laughs> I see someone answered four and a half uh, as a as a solution, yeah. So for, I'm not sure what would be a fraction of a of a branch length. Um, let me see. How can I get back now? Um, maybe here. So. Um, yeah, the question here is how many topologies uh, we have. Oh, here it is. So what do I have? Okay, I've, I've asked as a question is actually for four leaves. Um, so maybe don't answer that question quite yet. Uh, sorry. Uh, I sh maybe should have asked that for, for four leaves as well, uh, for three leaves as, uh, first. Um, so maybe use the chat for that, okay. <laughs> sorry for all the gimmick. We're learning as we go here. Um, how many ways are they to connect uh, three different uh, three different leaves? Uh, okay, some people are suggesting three ways. So I wish I could ask you to draw uh, the other ways. Uh, if, for instance, you're suggesting this, maybe to put the B, the A, and the C like this, well, that's still the same tree. Uh, it just it still connects uh, the the um, the the leaves in the same way if you just do a rotation it doesn't really change the meaning of the tree um so okay now i see uh most of you now are going to one so this is indeed the case right it's only actually there's only one way you can connect uh in an unrooted tree your three leaves again you know you the, the, the kind of the edge case i mentioned before where one is for instance an internal node that's not really um, so, uh, yeah, that, that, that is not really a difference. So I see vertical and horizontal node, plus vertical and horizontal. I'm not quite sure um, what you mean. If you mean, again, if I, I'm going to draw this, if you mean, for instance, drawing it like this, A, uh, B, C, and, um, and like this, and I'm going to make it extra confusing. Well, no, let me just do it like this, A, B, C. Well, that is the same tree. Now you may say, well, but how about that, for instance? B, and then here I have A and C. Well, these are different trees, but that's because they are rooted differently, right? Uh, so these are not unrooted trees. Now, if you view them as unrooted, if you, you're saying, well, actually, really, the, the, the root here is meaningless. I've just drawn it in this way. Then it is the kind of the same tree, let's say. I say it's equivalent kind of uh, in an unrooted uh, uh, interpretation. Why? Because you can imagine the way I, I, I you know, I'm thinking about this uh, is that if you just, you know, you keep all of the connections alike and you just now, let's say you, 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 you pull that branch here, you pulled it, pulled it, pulled it, pulled it and you keep all of the connections, then you would get that tree, right? So you don't have to change any of the order of connection. This is going to be, you know, if you pull it, then, you know, it would look like this, you know, you pull it, and now you would have C, A, and B. And now you can see how this is very much, uh, you know, the same topology as this. So you can see, so we've already now covered, um, so these are these were all unrooted topologies, okay? But with three, I hope this is clear. Uh, with just three nodes, 
I'm going to clear everything now. Um, all of the drawing. We have really just one way of connecting them. I just to show you that all of these are the same. I'm not putting them in order. Okay, so ABC. Now, how about four? Okay, and let's forget about this WooClap thing because I see with the, with the chat it just works just as well, and I re, I, I regret to have done that gimmick now. But anyway, um, let's just use the chats and tell me if we added now one more um, one more um, uh, leaf, how many waves I can add one more leaves? Maybe it's a, that's another way of putting. Uh, uh, putting it. Someone think there's still only one possibility, but the majority seem to think three, someone two. Okay, so indeed, indeed, we have three branches. We can connect our node D either here, you know, that would be one topology. And in this case, if you look at the, 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 the semantic A and D um, are specially closed and then B and C, but I could also connect D here, okay? In which case C and D are, are close to one another and then A and B are close, or I could connect here B and D um, and then A and C, okay? So sometimes people just write this, you know, uh, in a text manner, you know, it's just saying, okay, you know, you have A, C and B, D, that are together, for instance, that, that is also conveying the tree now in a text format. Okay, this is actually, a, if you add a semicolon, this is actually a new week format. Okay. Um, anyway, so indeed there are three ways. So we went from one way to three now. How, uh, so can D be added to this at the center? Very good question. So what happens if I add the center? A, B. C, and I do this. Okay, so now what is this? This is no longer a binary tree, right? We have here what we would call a polytomy or a multifurcation. And we have more than one, I mean, the, the, the three edges. Okay, yeah, it is no longer binary. Now, you may say, well, no, but what if it's a tiny weeny uh, middle branch? Then, um, then yes, indeed. Then that's the same tree as this one, for instance, potentially, with uh, as this one with this branch being uh, set to zero, right? Then you get that tree. But now, what happens is that there's still three ways you might be able to connect that, and so it could be you know A and C that are like this, and that branch that is of length zero, or it could be. A, B that are like that, and that branch is equal to zero. Uh, so if you go back to binary tree, you are back to your three topologies. And you may say, well, isn't this a bit, uh, you know, for the theoretical question, but actually, for instance, if you look at the coronavirus, um, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, to be, to, be, to be precise, and you look at the, um, at the tree, there are so few changes that there are many, many such internal branches, which, um, are uh, essentially of length zero. And this is in important for the interpretation because, um, you know, these zero branch lengths are, are meaningless. And even though the most of the programs, they will still return a binary tree, uh, you cannot draw conclusions about the order of all of the branches that are connecting at the same place. And if you know that, for instance, on average, well, at least that was true about about six weeks ago uh, when we were looking at uh, at sequences, and they were at that time maybe already around fifty thousand sequences available um, worldwide. Uh, they, they very very few differences. You know, these are thirty thousand a character long, and there's on average only about thirty differences. And so, you know, you think of this as really a tree that is extremely compact with most branches or. Yeah, the vast majority being of, uh, of length zero, one, or perhaps a two substitution um, over the entire genome. And so that's actually important for the interpretation. If your branch length is, is zero, then you may have multiple topology that actually, multiple binary topology that mean the same thing. 
Okay, well, I digress a little bit, and that's a risk of, uh, of um, having a, a whiteboard and, and interesting questions. Um, so maybe we should go back to the slides and, and try to progress a little bit, given that according to the timetable, we only have five minutes to cover all of tree inference, um, which seems uh, a little bit ambitious. We'll see uh, what we manage to do. Okay, so let me get back to uh, my slide deck. Okay, so we've covered all of that. That is wonderful. Uh, not gonna, so yeah, the, okay, the important thing here and with which we could have spent a little bit more time on uh, is what happens when we add uh, more taxa. And as you can see, you know, for three, we saw that we had one unrooted tree, then we went to three. And then the thing is, then it grows very quickly because when we go to five, remember we had three possibilities uh, of a tree with of size four. And each of these uh, um, trees has five branches. So when we add our fifth taxon, we've got five choices uh, to connect it to in three, uh, three different starting topologies. So that's three times five, and that's 15. And then we, when we go from five to six taxa, we've got um, a tree. So we remember when we go from four to five, we're going to add two more branches. We have seven branches and we have 15 topology, 15 times seven, that's 105. So really the key here, contrary to- Christophe, uh, Christoph, yes? sorry, wrong screen. You're sharing the wrong screen. Oh. We okay. see the, the book. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, thank you. Yeah, a few um, transitions that can be improved. Yeah, it's, it's treacherous because I took this book cover um, for, for the slide and so it's, so where am I now? Am I sharing the right screen? Yeah, no, I need to be in the right app. Okay, so here it is. That's better, yeah. We saw that. Sorry about that and thank you, Rob, uh, for, for this intervention. Uh, <laughs> could have gone a long time before noticing. Um, yeah, you can see that when we add more and more taxa, uh, the, the, the number of possibilities multiplies. It is the number of starting topology times the number of branches where you can add these extra branches. And so that grows very quickly. And that's certainly the case for unrooted trees. And for rooted trees, it's very much the, actually it's the same, in fact, the same number just shifted by one because you can think of the roots as, you know, being like an extra taxon. And the position of the root, it would be like, where is the position of that extra extra leaf? I, by the way, I say taxon or leaf interchangeably. This is a jargon about trees, um, a taxon um, or a leaf of the tree. Okay. Um, so we've seen already, and, and in my drawing, I already tried to convey the notion that um, that these uh, that there are many equivalent trees as well, and I think one mental model I've you saw you saw that that was like maybe to think of these as uh, as strings and then you're putting some of these strings. Actually, one also quite nice uh, uh, metaphor uh, or yeah or analogy is that of the the mobile, you know these these devices that I often use is for uh, uh, for, for for babies, um, and so. There too, the, the orders of connection doesn't change, but everything can rotate and, and it's still essentially the same topology. And well, in this case also, yeah, the same topology, the same branch length. So as a result, if we look at this uh, tree of, uh, of, uh, of uh, primates, um, yeah, these, two, these two representations are equivalent. The only difference are you know, some rotations around internal edges uh, so around internal nodes, uh, you can see here the gibbon. Uh, they are all they are still together, and the agile and crested gibbons are uh, forming a clade, for instance. However, this is different from uh, that topology, and so maybe someone can put in the chat. Uh, this, can someone spot the difference uh, between these two trees? Forget about the mobile. This is uh, <laughs> this is not what I meant. I mean the difference between this or that tree with the, and, and this one. 
So the, these two equivalents. So what, what's the difference between, the, between these two? Let me see your responses there in the chat. Okay, yes, the orangutan, very good. This is where we have a difference, right? You can see in, on the top here, the orang um, is outside here of the, the hominids. Uh, and, um, and in this case, the gorilla is outside and the orang is inside. So indeed, this is the difference. You could, so I, I guess you, you start to see, you know, the difference that are meaningful and the one that are not. Um, excellent. So one important thing, and I already alluded that, uh, to that, is that uh, there is also some connection between amount of divergence at the, the sequence level, which is the thing that we can infer, and, um, and time. Uh, and so there's a, this really classic paper by Zucker, Candle and Pauling from 1965. You can see this is shortly, uh, pretty shortly after even DNA was discovered. If you think, you know, 1953, people start to understand the, the, uh, the, the genetic codes. Um, and fairly quickly, there's this idea, well, maybe the changes that are observed might be indicative also of a amount of time. That's also connected with the neutral theory of Kimura, which was uh, published a bit later, um, well, early 80s. But um, you, around that period, people are trying to understand you know, this relationship between uh, sequence divergence here on the x-axis and, uh, well, time divergence here indicated by the fossil record. And it looks like, for instance, if you look at cytochrome C, that there is a pretty linear relationship, particularly if you get rid of all the outliers, uh, then you really get a very nice uh, line. And so you, this is already, you know, hinting at the fact that, you know, it's not a, a perfect uh, law and, and you, you know, in any gene you will find already uh, some exception. And typically the, you know, the further you, you go back in time, the bigger is the departure um, you will observe between the, um, sequence divergence and, um, and time divergence. However, it is still something that is helpful uh, for the interpretation of the trees. So this is a bit of follow-up work, I think beautiful figure, and you can see here different type of uh, genes that evolve at different rates. And in this figure, you know, it, it looks like it's like a you know, perfect molecular clock uh, where this, this, this relationship, uh, um, you know, holds beautifully. Uh, but of course, you know, all this data was uh, uh, quite seriously messa messaged. And as we got more data coming in, you know, these things started to break down a little bit. So this is more recent work. Uh, still, you know, arguably before really the uh, high throughput uh, genomics era. And already we can see depending on the clades uh, and the distance, there are some jumps. And so it's no longer really... Uh, you know, a straight line, things get a little bit more messy. But still, it is so that, you know, you, you will often observe fewer changes for sequences that are, uh, that have diverged more recently. So maybe if, if there's not a linear relationship, at least uh, you, you can get a loose order, um, uh, ordering and, 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 and a sense. Um, okay, so there's this here. So if the clock holds, then you should be able to um, to calibrate your tree and you know and give it maybe some dates for some of the the key splits and importantly if all of these uh, these uh, DNA um, all of the species here are still uh, alive today still extant uh, species then you should be able to, you know they should all appear um, on a on a the same same distance from the roots, uh, the same height of the tree. Um, now, for instance, if I go back now to the COVID data, they, because this is a quite a quick evolutionary process, um, and sam sampling is happening, uh, you know, at different time points. Even for a clock-like tree, you may have a variation in terms of where, uh, you know, where the leaves are, uh, in terms of the, the height of the tree. 
Okay. Um, so now, okay. Actually, I'm, I'm running out of time and I'm thinking that we are going to leave uh, some of the, the methods part, you know, how to infer a tree um, to the practicals uh, this afternoon. Uh, but I think, that, you know, at, at the end of the day, I think the interpretation of the trees is much more important for all of you uh, than to know how to infer them because ultimately, uh, I mean, okay, well, both are important. <laughs> we just have to make some tough choices. But I'd rather have you, you know, start with like a good interpretation of the tree, which is why you know, um, we may have to cut a little bit on the on the inference part. But I think this could be done also a little bit more hands-on together with the exercise this afternoon. And of course, I will I will give you my my slides um, so you can you can also um, uh, have a look at at you know kind of this summary um, just enough so that you could also do the exercise and kind of learn in a more active way. But maybe just the last thing I'd like to cover before we, 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 we have a break is how to root the tree because that's, you know, we've already started discussing this a little bit. And so the, 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 the typical way of doing this, again, you can't get it uh, straight out of the, um, of most programs and most models of evolution because they are essentially really just measuring differences. And it's hard, you know, if you just see some differences to know who started, uh, you know, in, in which direction did the change happen. Uh, now, if you just have two, you know, people apart and you know they were once at the same place, it's hard to know, you know, who uh, walked away or maybe both people walked away so you, you know you can think of it in a little bit in this way if you have a tree you know it relates all of these distances um to all of the the, the leaves but again it's very hard to know uh where it all started from just from this this divergence the only method that can attempt to do that from the sequence themselves are methods that assume that there is a there's a general trend towards, say, for instance, a different type of uh, GC content or amino acid composition, in which case maybe you can, you can polarize your tree in this way. But that's, these are very uh, unusual methods. The, 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 the way most people root the tree is using prior knowledge. So in this case, uh, if you have some prior knowledge that, you know, you know that um, uh, you, may, you may use, for instance, these are all, uh, all apes and then you may want to use a monkey which you think you postulate is an out group, you can add this uh, monkey to the, to, the, to the tree reconstruction and then to simply yeah, postulate that the root is then on that branch, on the out group. That would be a very common way to do that. But I want to draw your attention and we're going to discuss this uh, also in the, the next hours when we are going more like from a, from a species perspective to a gene uh, evolution perspective um, that uh, it's not so easy sometimes to find a good out group because, uh, um, you know, yeah, for reasons that I will discuss later, it's not always available. Um, so an out group is what you need here. Of course, it, you know, if it's really quite distant, for instance, if you took a, a bacterium, you would say, okay, I really want to be on safe ground. I'm going to take E. coli as an out group. Uh, you could. In fact, for some genes that we are that we could still relate across primates and um, you know and bacteria across all of the tree of life, uh, you might be able to do that. Uh, uh, however, the problem is that your tree then becomes really quite uncertain in terms of where this bacterium is connecting. So you you then have more of a problem that yeah you know definitely on which branch it is, but the rest of the tree, particularly the point where this branch connects that may start now to become uh, uh, you know, quite uncertain. So the ideal outgroup is not too far, so not to ruin your topological inference, uh, but is close enough, uh, but, but is far enough that you know with confidence that the, bro the, the, the root is on that branch. And I will, for the sake of completeness, and sorry, I, yeah, I do have this tendency of not being able uh, to, uh, uh, to, to stop talking. Um, there is also another way which is really quite common 
uh, is to take the midpoint. And the midpoint routing is to say, okay, well, let's just find the point here in that tree that will result in the most balanced tree. And this usually uh, might fail when you have several competing uh, choices because the tree is, is rarely completely balanced. Uh, for instance, if you looked at the, at the mammals, the rodent clay tend to uh, evolve faster. And so, you know, if you, that, that may mislead you if you use that to root the tree of mammals. Uh, I mean, the midpoint, you, 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 you might uh, get the wrong roots. However, it gives you a rough idea. And, you know, it stands to reason that, for instance, if the, if the root was here in a place that would really unbalance your tree, that would imply, um, that, would imply that, you know, you had the same amount of, uh, uh, in, in the same time as you went from the root to the crest of gibbon, sorry, from the crest of gibbon, you had all of this other evolution taking place which is really unlikely, okay? So it, give, it still gives kind of a, a, a rough idea, the midpoint routing, having a, a balanced tree. And so I wanted to mention this, sometimes it's also disparaged, but actually um, it's better than nothing. And in some cases, uh, particularly when you have few uh, splits uh, toward the middle, uh, it may be a very good estimate. Like, I'm, and I'm thinking, again, if I'm thinking ahead of, uh, what we're going to see later, if you have one duplication uh, near the roots and then long branches and then you know two sub trees, it's going to be very difficult to uh, to to envision a rooting that requires uh, you know something completely unbalanced. Okay, so I think you still deserve some break. So what I'm going to suggest that we do, we're a bit late, but I don't want to cut too much into the break. So. How about we try to uh, start at 10.05, well, in 10 minutes, in whatever time zone you might be. Um, and, um, you know, you can grab a, a beverage and I'm going to open up like these breakout rooms, if you like. So what you could do, if you like to spend some time sort of chatting uh, with, with some people on the, on, the, on the course is when you have your, your beverage or you've done your, your uh, you've stretched your legs, you can join one of the break, breakout rooms. Otherwise, you don't have to, and then we will restart very soon. Thank you very much. Um, and so let me actually, actually, uh, Patricia, are you still on the call? Yeah, I am. Okay, uh, so I you, think you you've can. got to do that because uh, I, I, I will, yeah, yeah, I need to be host for that, not, <laughs> yeah. not, not merely co-host. No. Uh, yeah. Okay, I have created some some rooms. Okay. And people can decide to join in or not whenever they want. Okay. Yeah. Very good. I see my iPad is, is asked to join breakout room two and then my computer breakout room six. So oh, you have to, yeah. <laughs> Double your personality. Okay, very good. Yeah, this is a very br uh, short break. But actually, I've been, I had an exchange uh, in a breakout room, and also I was thinking about it as I was pouring my coffee. Perhaps some of you would be very disappointed in, in not hearing more about tree reconstruction now, particularly those of you who are not attending the, the, the tutorial this afternoon. So I have actually prepared a little poll here. And uh, so if you could go. Uh, it's funny that there's no correct answer. Okay. Um, I prepared a little poll on WooClap uh, to ask you whether you'd like to hear a little bit more about trees now, to kind of to survey a little bit your preferences. So please um, go and, and, and answer this now. Um, and it will give me a sense of uh, whether um, you want to move on to ortology or you want to do a little bit more trees. So, um, yeah, I can see some facts. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. So to, not to spend more time on the survey than on the, on the, on the topic itself, I can see there's about two thirds who would like to have uh, just a very brief overview. So to leave enough time for the rest and there would be uh, 20, 28% who would be keen on just moving on and very few who want to talk uh, about trees all more about train friends all morning. So that's very helpful to know. Uh, so I will suggest that yeah, I, I will try to be really concise and then um, you will have a, uh, a chance to, uh, for those of you who are in the practicals, to get things in practice um, a bit later. So here, um, let me just share my slides, uh, share my screen, yeah. Okay, so how do we infer project tree? So I'm just going to give an overview. So the one thing to note first is that the trees are relating an average um, of the evolution over the entire sequence. Uh, you are going to have some positions that are highly conserved and some that are more variable. And this is what the, the, all of the model that we observe, they treat every column uh, in our aligned sequence as one piece of information, one independent piece of information. Um, and so as I already pointed out now, you need first to find the corresponding uh, characters and so this is this process of alignment you, you, you I'm sure that uh, most of you know about this already and there are some tools for this and this is the, the purpose of that is to identify the characters that are homologous that were once you know they all, that all descended basically from the from the same from, from the same molecule uh, well the same residue in the same molecule and there's lots of tools for that, and I'm sure that you've got your favorite tool. I'm not gonna spend time on this. Um, what I will just say is that there are, I mean, it depends how you wanna um, classify these things, but one way to do that is, is that there, you could say there are two main uh, groups of methods. Some that are trying then to infer a tree that relates this, uh, uh, that explains, you know, this, this, this pattern um, based on the similarity of every pair of sequence. Um, and for that, you know, you have methods such as uh, UPGMA and neighbor joining. And um, I'm just gonna be, you know, just give like a 30 seconds overview of that. Or you could try to build a tree which then uh, has um, an ex a more explicit model of how this sequence might evolve along the tree and look at lots of different scenarios and then decide whether these scenarios uh, are, uh, are likely or uh, yeah, are likely in light of the data that you observe. And so for instance, if you observe very few differences between uh, mouse and rats, but more difference between the rat and the human, um, when you when you have a model of evolution that is along a tree where the human the rat are very close then this is uh going to be rather unlikely uh and so maybe these topology and branch like are going to be dismissed that's that's roughly like the categorization and in general what what is happening under the hood when you run a, a typical tree inference package is that you first need a way to get a, a starting topology, a first guess of what the, the, the wiring might be of your tree. And for that, you could use a method, for instance, this type of uh, clustering approaches that start with all the pairwise uh, differences and then um, score it, score that, that, that tree with a model now that uh, is a little bit more, uh, for instance, a probabilistic model of what is the chance that the sequence evolved along that scenario. And what's the chance of observing the data that we have now? And what you're going to do then is just to compare this with another tree. And if you see, oh, actually, this is more likely to have given rise to this data. So it's kind of a maximum likelihood type of approach, then you're going to favor that or you may have also kind of a Bayesian flavor of that where you have also some priors and you don't only consider the maximum likelihood estimate, but a distribution of trees. 
um, and you know how do you how do you search through that enormous space we saw there are many many different topologies um, you know I um, no longer have the slides on but you remember they were yeah many billions of topologies already for trees of uh, a handful of species uh, you know maybe a dozen leaves already you have you have uh, billions of topologies uh, topologies and usually we're dealing with much larger, larger trees we cannot test them all um, and so we typically they are uh, applying some local changes to the tree and seeing how uh, do they get an improvement or not um, so I'm not going to go now into the details um, I mentioned, yeah, UPGMA is this approach that starts with some sort of pairwise distance, and then you recursively try to group the thing that look like um, uh, they're, the, they're the closest. So, you know, I mean, without going into detail here, uh, if, if this was a representation in uh, an embedding in 2D, you know, you would pick first these two because they are very close, and then maybe these two, and then you build, you, you, you group everything, and that gives you a topology. Um, yeah. Distance trees is a bit different, is that we have, you have um, some unknowns in terms of the, the branches that you have on your tree, and you have your, the, the distance from any pair of leaves, and you're trying to reconcile the two by uh, finding the, the branch length that explain best, you know, these this pairwise dis distances. And because the number of pairwise distance that grows quadratically, uh, but we've seen earlier that the number of branches uh, only grows linearly, you know, with just every time you add one more leaf, one leaf you, you have a constant number of additional uh, uh, branches, uh, these can be solved. Uh, but yeah, I'm not going again into detail here. Um, then trees that are using parsimony, what they do is, so they need already to have like some example topologies, uh, not example, sorry, some, some uh, candidate topologies. And what they will do is to say, okay, how many changes do we need um, to, um, to explain the data that we have given that topology. And so for instance, here to give a very concrete example, here, this is not DNA, these are just characters that I have drawn here. But for instance, uh, if all of these species have a tail, uh, no matter what uh, way you're considering as a tree, you will never need any change. You can just assume that all the ancestors also had a tail and that doesn't need, need any change. But for instance, you know, if you're that species one and two can fly and species three and uh, one and two can fly and species uh, can, cannot fly and three and four can fly. Here, you just need one change with this topology. You could assume that the ancestor here couldn't fly. And then here on that branch, uh, you know, they, they, they acquire this ability once. So that's one change. And then that's retained in species three and four. So that topology will get a higher score that if you had, for instance, one, three, two, four, because then you would need um, flights to be invented twice or to be lost twice. And so this is how you can start scoring. And this is just the parsimony approach, just counts the number of changes. It's got also some shortcomings, uh, but it's extremely fast. Um, and yeah, maximum likelihood I mentioned already, it's essentially this is in this mathematical formula. To, we want to maximize the probability of observing our sequences given a model of evolution, which may have some parameters, uh, but don't worry too much about, about, about the model here. I mean, all we've discussed so far, and that, that's, I think, in, enough for this discussion, is, is just counting the number of changes. And of course, we know that some uh, substitution are more likely than others. There's a difference between transition and transversion at the DNA level. Uh, in fact, there's some difference between any uh, of type of substitution. And we see this again, I'm relating this now to, to, the, to the SARS uh, uh, COV2 again, where we see an excess in uh, C to T changes. That's very specific. That could be taken care of by the model 
but here we've just talked about uh, just a, 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 you know counting the number of changes and 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 assuming that this is equivalent for any uh, character to any character and that's a that's a start um, and also this is given the the tree so this is given a topology and some branch length and now you can see that if you change the model on the tree and you get a, a high likelihood of preserving our sequences that may indicate that we have the correct model on the tree but you know the cost of that is that you have to try many many different uh, combination um, and uh, you know at some points uh, you know it's, it's not always easy to do this optimization and uh, yeah you're never going to be able to to consider all the possibilities so even under the model even if your data uh, is very well modeled by your your model uh, it, it may still you may still not find the best tree in some cases okay the only thing maybe that is worth uh, uh, really mentioning here it's bootstrap bootstrapping um, because and branch support in general this is a I've, I've highlighted some of the difficulties we have in uh, in inferring the correct tree uh, so to gauge uncertainty is something that is of high interest and so i'm sure that many of you have already seen these numbers that are provided as branch support measure first of all i should i just want to make it very clear that almost all of these measures they are with respect to a branch not a node not the routing or or some other aspect of the tree or a global measure of the tree now this is some something that is measuring the confidence we have in a branch now what does this mean this is something that is uh, actually also even quite debated in the literature but the rough idea which i hope is something that is going to be defensible in all circumstances uh, the rough idea is that if you have a high branch support you are, you have a high confidence that that branch exists and what does it mean that a branch exists it means you can separate uh, things that are on one side of the branch to the things that are on the other side of the branch so for instance if i go back to a tree yeah here if for instance uh, let me take this maybe the simplest example if this branch has a high support if i think this is really i have a high confidence in this branch this means i believe that uh, uh, the gorilla human and chips are on one side of the tree and the orangutan and all of the gibbons on the other side okay this is a, has an unrooted interpretation the, the support it's always uh, almost always like this I, I say almost because you know i'm sure someone can brandish a paper where they, they, they did it a bit differently but uh, you know 99 percent of the of the cases um so the support indicates a, a you know a split a branch and maybe that one is uncertain in fact you know it is known that there are some because of incomplete linear sorting you can find some genes that um where human and gorilla um, uh, the, the the human and gorilla gene um well actually some genes in the human and the gorilla population uh, coalesce earlier than uh, than the chimp and etc because these were not just a single individual you had a population and uh, the same way as if any any two person participating in, in this course we have some genes that have a much more recent common uh, ancestry and some genes that, that uh, you need to go back deeper in the history to find um, a common ancestor because of uh, you know recombination um, that could be that could even span beyond the boundary of species so that's actually uh, that short branch is actually uh, rather uncertain in the sense that um, we can certainly find many uh, you know a lot of genetic material where that is not even going to be the correct topology uh, in terms of the species in general and we think of the time of speciation uh, it is still so that uh, you know it's well accepted now that human and chimp are uh, you know should branch uh, should, should group together 
However, you know, you could say from a, a tree reconstruction point of view, depending on the molecular character that you're looking at, uh, that branch may be quite uncertain. But if this branch has a high support value, regardless of the particular, um, the particular ordering of the branch in that subtree, we will definitely be able to, to, to split these two parts. Okay, so how do we compute that? Well, bootstrapping is, a, is, is quite an elegant approach. Uh, and so I do have a slide on this. I wanna show you that. The idea is that, remember, we have our input matrix, our input alignments, and each column is, is like one observation. And so what we really ideally would want to do is like to say, okay, well, why don't we take another sample, uh, another sample of the data and just try to reconstruct the tree and see how different the trees are. And if we get exactly the same tree and, and by which I mean all the branches are present still in that tree, then we have a very high confidence. If, however, we see, you know, there are some rearrangement around some of the branches, then we may wonder, you know, how, how robust our prediction is. So it's a kind of a permutation test. Um, and the way this works with bootstrapping, well, we, we can't generate extra data typically for our data set, but we can resample from our data. So the idea is to do a resampling with replacement. And, you know, this is backed by some theory. If you've got enough data, you're sampling from the underlying distribution. So for instance, here, if you're, you know, your best estimates, uh, your maximum likelihood tree for these four um, sequences give you A, B, and C, D on the other side. Uh, now you could do some replicates, our pseudo replicates as they are called sometimes. And you can see in this case, I sample the second column twice, okay? Because it's a sampling with replacement and I've lost the, the fourth column. But you know, uh, this is, uh, this is still a legit thing to do. And when you have uh, large data matrices, it, um, it, it approximates quite well, the, again, this underlying distribution. And uh, in this case, maybe it doesn't affect the topology. And you do that a couple of times, maybe quite often people do that a hundred times. Um, and then you could look at, for instance, your middle branch here, which is the only branch uh, which uh, is uncertain. Um, you can see in how many, how often do you observe the branch that you observe on your original data. And here we have just two replicates and we only got it uh, A, B on one side and C, D on the other for one of the two replicates. So here we would say that the support measure is 0 0.5. And so you can see it's a bit costly because you have to do all these replicates. And you know, if your inference process took you a certain time T, now, when you do 100 tree, you need 100 T uh, to, um, to, to do the inference. Of course, you know, these days people have used clusters. So, you know, maybe it's just a, like a parameter that you change to now ask for 100 process in parallel. And then you're not spending more time waiting for your tree. Um, but there are also lots of other measures that have been developed that are typical, typically approximations just for, for uh, speed. Uh, but the bootstrap is, is, is still something that uh, I would call um, uh, like almost like a, the, the gold standard for, for, um, for branch support. Okay, so I just see, and I, I was gonna stop here. I just see there's one question. I'm gonna take this question. Um, oh, actually, there's been a few more questions. Uh, okay, let me, let me answer these few questions. So, uh, First one, is there a really big difference between trees inferred by different algorithms? Okay, that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> so you could have sometimes differences even between trees that are inferred by the same algorithm if you run it on different machines because of some of the decision. But in terms of, you know, if you look, if you take into account the uncertainty in, in, of the tree with the support measure, uh, hopefully you won't get really inconsist too inconsistent results. If, however, your, your conclusion depends on the choice of a particular tree, you have to be very careful. And, uh, you know, they're in the literature and, you know, there's been a lot of debates. Usually the, one, the methods that are viewed as being more reliable are the likelihood approaches, like maximum likelihood uh, Bayesian approaches rather than parsimony. Parsimony could be 
you know, has, you can find some cases where parsimony will fail systematically. Uh, and so uh, people don't like that, you know, the idea that as you add more and more and more data, you convert to the wrong answer. That's unbearable to some people. But I think, you know, if you need to rely on a particular uh, model to support your conclusion, you should really uh, have a very careful look at your tree and ask yourself, you know, why is it that these assumptions are affecting your, your conclusion? And so the, ideally, uh, your conclusions don't, don't hinge on a particular choice of method. Okay, and another question, if the bootstrap value is less, is it better to take the sequence of our data? Well, again, this depends on our conclusion. I think it's perfectly fine to have uh, part of your tree that are unresolved if these are not the parts of the tree you're drawing strong conclusion on. Uh, that's okay, it's just, you know, you let the data speak, uh, provide some confidence intervals, and it may be irrelevant. If you, however, this is like to support your main finding, uh, then you've got to maybe discuss your conclusion and then weaken it a little bit. Uh, and, you know, in some cases, they may have some tactical decision. If it's a part of the tree that is not so relevant and you'd rather have like a fully resolved tree, yeah, it could be good to remove it. In fact, I'm, you know, coming back also to COVID data, uh, to, to, to SARS-CoV-2 data, and, uh, and there we also have this phenomenon because we have so many very, very short branches, it may be that you know, many of these short branches are hard to resolve, but we can still at a more kind of general level uh, tell that you know, that group of sequence is separated from that group of sequence. So if the focus is on this more distant one, then yeah, definitely remove all of the, the intermediate one. You know, they are not that relevant, but then you end up with one long branch which is well supported and which at least enables you to relate these, uh, these two groups. So you might want to remove some sequences if they are actually not that interesting, but actually uh, induce a lot of uncertainty in terms of, uh, you know, collection of short branches. Okay, see also some questions on the Google Doc. Is there a really big difference between trees inferred by different algorithms? Okay, so that, that is the same, um, cover that. Uh, well, the tree similarity measure, uh, I should say, this is specific to a, a, an algorithm. So I would lump that into, into the same thing. I mean, the similarity measure will be, uh, could have uh, also uh, um, a probabilistic interpretation. There's many different distance measure. So I would just consider this as part of the algorithm. Uh, how do you combine several protein sequence similarity, pre, uh, several protein sequence similarity to measure species distance. Okay, very good. We are going to have that in the practicals. And actually, this is already kind of something that we can discuss uh, in the second part. In the second part, we are going to, uh, to identify um, the relationship between genes. And then indeed, if we think of the species as like a bag of genes, then a common way to do that is, is then to concatenate, to put together the observation that you have for uh, orthologous gene. But we, you need orthologous gene. We're going to see that uh, in a few minutes. So maybe hold, hold that question for a bit later. And then can bootstrapping be misleading looking at highly similar tandem repeats containing units in the multiple sequence? Element? Okay, this is a quite a specific question. So, <laughs> I mean, the, the, so I think what um, whoever asked this question means with this is when you have tandem repeats, it is quite difficult to do a good alignment because you have different units. They are all quite similar and you're not quite sure which one relates to which. So the alignment methods may struggle. And what's more, if that number of repeats ver uh, varies rapidly in the evolution, you, know, you tend to have, you acquire one more unit, you lose some. In fact, you could argue that you don't even have a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, one uh, unit in, 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 on one gene and the, you know, maybe like two units that are the result of very uh, like recent expansion. 
Uh, and so for that, you know, the alignment itself may, may, may not even be a very good uh, model uh, to relate these individual residues. So I think this is, it's a, it's a big problem for the alignment potentially. Now, in terms of the bootstrap, it is true. And I think now I see where you're going with this is that the bootstrap usually fixes the alignment, assumes that the alignment was correct and only resamples the column. So you're going to, you know, to the extent that you made mistakes in your alignment and there's uncertainty in your alignment, you're not going, this is not going to be reflected in your resampling procedure. So one thing you could do is, uh, you know, one, okay, one thing, I mean, this, there's been some uh, specialty literature on this and I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's really quite specific, but you could think about resampling, uh, a resampling procedure that also takes into account the, the alignment uncertainty, but that's also quite tricky because you see, when you are treating every observation as independent, each column as independent, now they no longer are if you are trying to sample in a, in a different way particularly one that uh, connects with the alignment. So this is a, this is a tricky question. Uh, I should, can I say also one more thing now already ahead of time is that this afternoon, for those of you who are in the practical, the last hour from four to five, we're going to have like a clinic where some of you who have like specific questions about your, your own project, your PhD project or postdoc project or whatever project that you might have. Uh, if you want to have some discussions and some questions about that, you'll have more time and we could do that even like one-on-one -on -one with myself or some of the postdoc in the group. Okay. Um, I think, okay, so that we have, we still have two, two more questions. I mean, I, I really enjoy the question. I think it, this is also, you know, some of the added value here as opposed to me doing like a recording and putting it on YouTube. So uh, I, I, it's hard for me to resist answering this question now, um, uh, but, I'm also mindful of time. So I'm just going to take these two, but please don't write more questions for now. I won't be able to resist not answering them otherwise. And we don't have any moderator uh, to cut me off. So uh, referring to the previous example, if chimp human gorilla branch has high support, will the orangutan uh, score uh, the same support? Could it be different? Yeah, so it is with the classical bootstrap, this is completely orthogonal. Um, the, the measure is going to be based on uh, the different uh, replicate and you only focus on the branches that are in the original tree and see how frequently they occur. And so if you have a long, typically the longer branch, they are more, they are more stable. So you could have this scenario where you have a long, very clear branch and a short branch next to it. And the short branch, you know, the rearrangement here are all over the place. And so the, the support is very low and that long branch is a very good uh, support. Now, of course, you know, if you have a whole part of the tree that is highly uncertain and you have uh, like a, say a rapid radiation of species, it could be that you have a, a whole cluster of, of, of branches that are poorly resolved. So, you know, everything's possible. Okay, and then neighbor joining and distance method don't consider the evolution of the sequence, but are still widely used in papers. How much these uh, phylogenies are reliable for inferring the phylogenies? Okay, they do consider the evolution of the sequence. Um, and um, maybe the two things that are, you know, the, the, the problem with neighbor joining and distance method is that, you know, conceptually is that because you look at things in isolation to one another, um, to compute the distance, then when you put everything together, you have to make sure that your distance are, uh, are actually consistent. They measure the same thing. So for instance, if you did the measure based on very different sequence length and you had some part of the sequence that is, uh, you know, some pairs of sequence have a lot of character in common, which evolve at a different rate than, than other pairs, which have very few in common, that could skew your distance a lot. Uh, in some cases, even the pairwise distance are done with inconsistent alignments. You know, you, you don't even have, uh, it's not consistent in the sense that if you are looking at what you know, your, the distance between A and B is computed on a set of characters, you know, that implies some homology. And then you look at B and C that implies also a certain homology. And then it's, you, you can see that that implies also then some homology between A and C. And then actually then the alignment is different. So 
these are this is more like the type of problem that you have with the distance method which is that it could be less consistent but it means also less consistent sometimes could be also less consistently wrong right it could be in some cases a bit more robust so i i am quite open-minded about this i think sometimes neighbor joining trees could be surprisingly good given how quick they are uh, but it is true that you have to be very careful when you use these type of methods in papers because you know referees have very strong opinion about these uh, and the, the, the problem in comparing these different methods is that well quite often we really don't know what is the correct tree and you know the method that is kind of uh, that is uh, has the, the, the most elegant model uh, and is shown at least in simulation to do the best is, is also going to be the, the method that then everyone favors and the likelihood approaches they have the advantage also is that you can add a lot of bell and whistle you can you, you can add a lot of sophistication to these models um, and you know it's so it's tempting to argue from first principle but i caution anyone to think that uh, the neighbor joining and distance stream method are necessarily worse i would say they they you can find cases where they are not as good but the devil's in the detail depends what you're using to uh, to compute your distances and also what sort of checks you're doing. Are you checking also uh, the you know whether your your distance are additive or not and 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 whether yeah you know how much again your conclusions are affected by the choice of method. For instance, and I'm, I, I think it's trying to relate this also to this current data from SARS-CoV-2 there, you have so few changes that actually whether you use a parsimony or a, a likelihood um, concept or in fact a distance uh, measure, you get essentially the same estimates. Um, and so there, it, it, it is much more about, the challenge is much more about trying to remove uh, characters that are where you have systematic errors and some some you know it's a different set of challenges and not so much this this these different approaches okay so i think many questions about that i hope that was helpful <laughs> um so let me start still a little bit the, the ortology business okay I'm, I'm i'm aware that you see this even with the with all of the the, the discipline I try to to have in, in not getting drawn too much into these fascinating discussions. Um, I'm still behind, I'm barely behind time. But anyway, we will try. We, do, we try to um, to teach you as as much interesting material as we can during the imparted time. And you know, um, you will have the feedback form at the end. And if you want another course with more material. Uh, you can express your views in there. Um, okay, so let me share my screen here. Okay, so we're moving now from uh, relating species to relating genes. Um, and uh, we'll see this central concept of ortology and paralogy. And I love this quote here. Um, that just highlights how much, but you know, even more so at the molecular level than the, at the morphological level. Um, you know, there's so much that is shared across all of the species, which is why our motivation to relate them. Um, though, I, keep in mind that was already that, that was. I mean, that Albert Clauber was a, a biochemist, so he could see this in terms of the biochemistry of different species. And that is certainly true at the genetic level too. Um, okay, so I think I may be able to cover a bit of like the, the basic definitions uh, and motivation for, for, for ortology biology before the break. Yeah, so duplication is really kind of the key concept here. Gene duplication, you know, the, the genes, they duplicate in a way that, um, that species uh, don't, I mean, okay, the speciation event is, you could think of it as a kind of a duplication also, but it is really the whole of the species that duplicates and then um, that evolve 
separately here we we have like some small parts quite often that just like individual genes that duplicate and you know that's i think really the key book there is uh is Ono's uh, book from 1970, Evolution by Gene Duplication. That's the 50th anniversary this year of that really wonderful book. Um, very accessible. I encourage uh, all of you, if you're interested in, uh, in, 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 in this topic in general, to, to have a look at that, that, that book, which kind of is mind blowing to think that a lot of the ideas are, you know, are, are still current uh, 50 years later. Um, in any case, and so in this book, you know, there's, I think there's a great deal that is uh, discussed about the fact that there's this tremendous um, constraint on the on the, the functional part of the of the um, of the genomes, and the, you know the way you can evolve new function is by creating a duplication. I mean, having some part that duplicates and then uh, the new copy uh, might take on some new role. Okay, so, okay, what's possible? It might still keep on doing whatever it was doing originally, but, um, but generally, if that is the case, then, you know, you could, you could think, well, but how, how can then purifying selection apply and get rid of, uh, you know, random uh, mutations that are happening uh, in, in these parts? And um, so quite often what will happen then is that, you know, after the duplication, actually what happens is you lose uh, the functionality, but in some cases, uh, maybe then it's free to evolve a new function. So, you know, functionalization and yeah, the, the, the other phenomenon that is often uh, also mentioned, Michael Lynch uh, is, a, is a good reference for that, is the idea of, uh, of sub-functionalization where now both copies can kind of specialize a little bit into into different subtasks that are maybe that was performed in a in a general way uh, when you only had one copy, but then in a necessary kind of a bit of a trade off between these two more specialized tasks. But in any case, so it it seems duplication seems to be a very interesting phenomenon to understand the emergence of new function in the genome and uh, but this also has then some practical implication and so here um, giving like a um, very simple case of you know here we see mouse and rats and uh, we have now these two copies and so that's very clear in this case when you have the two cop you know for instance two copies um, that you will have a pair that one, two pairs, um, and if you take the ones that's uh, the result of the most recent uh, duplicate, I mean, sorry. So here the model is we have an ancestral duplication uh, that give rise to these two copies. And when we compare the mouse and the rats, uh, the corresponding copies are the orthologs. So the ones that, yeah, okay, I don't wanna get too much ahead of myself. So we have got the orthologs and then the parallax will be either within the species, um, you know, these two still related copies, you know, they were once just the same gene, um, uh, but they are the result of a duplication that, you know, that, is, uh, that happened quite a bit of time in the past. But you could also have parallax across the two species, sometimes a, a misconception. So, uh, you know, here we still call these two uh, genes paralogous, uh, even though they are not within the same species. But they are the results of this uh, ancestral duplication. Now, where it starts to get messy is when you, when you, you know, you add like some extra species, maybe some of which have only one copy, and then you've got to ask yourself, okay, what is the ortho, you know, maybe these are um, the orthologs, uh, maybe these guys are the orthologs. In fact, in this case, and we're going to look at the definition of it now a bit more precisely. Um, actually, the human gene here is orthologous to all of them. So how do we define this now a little bit more rigorously? So this is the scenario that happened uh, in this example, where we first have a speciation event between here, the rodents and the primates. And then within the rodents, uh, we have, uh, I mean, actually at the, let's say still before the speciation of, of uh, mouse and rat, which takes place here, 
we have a gene duplication here depicted by a star, which gives rise to these two copies, uh, the blue and the, the, the red copy. And then we have a second speciation event. And now because the speciation events uh, affect the whole species, right? The, all of the genetic material uh, that induces now in terms of the, the gene family tree, a split both in the, in the blue and in the red gene. Okay, this is why you have two internal nodes that correspond to the second speciation event. And so the last concept I just want to, so, so the formal thing I want to introduce before the break is that the ortologs are the pairs of genes. So it's a pairwise relationship in, in, um, originally. Um, they are the pairs of genes that uh, start diverging through speciation events. So for instance, these two blue uh, genes, and these are genes that are just found where it, I just depict the, the species in which they are found. Just don't get confused by the fact here we're not talking about two, uh, two mice, two rats, and one human. We're talking about um, uh, two uh, mouse genes, two uh, rat genes, and one human gene. Um, and then when, if you're looking at, for instance, that uh, the mouse, the blue mouse gene and the red mouse gene, then because they start diverging through a duplication, they are called paralogs. They are not orthologs. Okay. And now I told you that the black gene here was orthogous to all of these. And that is because um, it is, you know, the last common ancestor is a gene that diverged through speciation again. So you can always, if you know the tree and you know the type of events in, at in, each internal node, you know what are all the orthologs and all the paralogs. Just to cover the last case, we said, you know, paralogs within a species here, that's a duplication event, Par paralogs across species, that blue, uh, gene with that red gene, if you go back in time, you can see it's a duplication event, so they're parallels. And here I have, you see here what I really have is kind of an ortology graph where each node is a gene and I've added an edge when two genes are ortologous. And you know, that's an edge between two nodes is a pairwise relationship. Okay, so we've covered already this definition. I suggest we have another break. Um, so it was quite a short break of the previous one. I, I su suggest we still keep our uh, 15 minutes so we can reconvene at 11.05. I don't know about the breakout rooms, how it worked for the others. Perhaps you can leave a, a, a feedback on the chat. Um, I was just with one other person. I suspect since not everyone's joining the breakout room, we're going to try to have bigger rooms. Uh, you know, you don't, don't, don't feel obliged to join, but if you want to join, you can. You can, And um, if you join for a while and then, you know, you run out of things to discuss, uh, that's also okay, you can leave. And yeah, I can see uh, there's only one in the breakout. Or we're just two. So we're gonna do fewer rooms, bigger, bigger rooms. Again, you know, you don't need to, to join, but if you'd like to, um, to have a chat reflect on the, on the course or discuss on something else, then we're going to, to, to do that again now. And we will carry on at 11.05. Uh, enjoy your break.
the full we i know that um some of the breakout room have are still closing now but i'm gonna get ready we're gonna get ready to continue uh with actually already this last session ah, time flies when we're having fun so we so let me um recap briefly so we we've uh, discussed the definitions of pairwise ortology and paralogy uh, and as you remember this is um you know the orthologs they start diverging through speciation and the parallax through, through duplication and if i go back to that um idea from from ono about evolution by gene duplication you can see why this may be relevant it's because um if we think that something special happens after duplication the fact that is you have the two copies that are still retained may be indicative of something new um, then we've got to be a bit careful when we are um, looking at uh, pairs of gene that um, you know that, that that are the result of duplications because maybe they you know something has changed at least at the functional level uh, so that is one motivation to distinguish orthologs and parallels but actually uh, it's not the only um, the only reason and so one reason now if we now relate to what we've seen earlier uh today is if we for instance want to build a species tree and we had this question earlier so we might have this this is essentially the same um no not it's actually not the same thing here now the the duplication happened even earlier you see this is in the ancestral mammal i just have a different representation someone asked me um James asked me earlier, you know, is, do I always, do we always use a star to indicate duplication? Not necessarily. You can see here in this case, um, uh, this is just a circle from a different color. So you have to, I'm afraid you have to, to look at the, read the, the caption of the figure to make sure that, uh, or the legend to, to, for the interpretation. But here we have an ancestral du uh, duplication in ancestral mammal, and then the speciation of human, well, uh, you know, primate and, and rodents, and then the rodents. And we have, you know, after the duplication here, the, 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 the two copies have been called K and L. Now, the thing is, if you just go and sample from gene bank, uh, human, mouse, and rat gene from that family, uh, if you're not careful, you might end up, you know, taking, you know, for instance, sampling the, the, the human, K copy, the rat K copy, and the mouse L copy. And then if you look at the relationship of the true tree here, you have human and rat on one side, and then mouse on the other. So the extent that you're looking at, uh, at the rooted tree, you're going to get the wrong topology. In terms also of the branch, like, you know, things are gonna be really out of whack because you have a seemingly much less divergence between human and, and rat. Uh, than to, to, to mouse, which is all of these branch lengths. And so when you're building a species tree or you're trying to use uh, the genes as a, as a proxy for the, for the whole, you know, for the genome in, in general, then you've got to uh, take autologous sequences or else uh, you might end up with uh, uh, the you know reconstructing the history of that particular gene family uh, because yeah it will look like that so and the, the the more general point is that the gene tree is not necessarily uh, you know, congruent with the species tree these are two different things and uh, however if you take a gene tree and only consider uh, genes which are orthologous to one another so that that means there's only speciation nodes on the tree, um, then that should, um, you know, be congruent uh, between the two. I'm saying should, because we've discussed also the fact that not every gene in a genome, even when you're taking uh, orthologous uh, um, genes and well, orthologous, the corresponding loci, uh, because 
of um, population level effect and, and, and the, the fact that it takes some time to coalesce uh, back in time because of incomplete linear sorting, you may occasionally have um, some, some, some small rearrangements around the, the tree. Uh, but um, uh, if you take Paralog, um, then you will almost definitely have uh, a different tree. Okay, so, you know, just as trees pervade uh, life science, ortology also using lots of different contexts. So I mentioned how there are some functional implications. Um, and, you know, we, we have very few model uh, species and complete genomes that are well annotated. And then usually whenever we sequence a new species or new genome, uh, we really rely on uh, on finding orthologous sequences to, to then propagate uh, functional knowledge. In some cases, we even use some paralogous sequences because, um, you know, there's, I mean, although uh, the orthologs tend to be a bit more conserved, uh, you know, the difference is not always very large. And so it may still be better to know, uh, you know, the kind of to have a, a rough idea about the function uh, using any sort of homologue um, than knowing nothing about the gene. Uh, however, you know, still, orthologs are usually favored as a case if you have to make a choice between different potential sequences uh, which you could use for to propagate function, you will use the orthologue. Um, and that could be also useful if you want to know what sort of model species is appropriate for a particular disease or a particular uh, aspect of human biology, um, for instance, um, you know, if, if um, well, I you know, think I'm thinking of the uh, diabetes and the fact that uh, insulin is duplicated in uh, in rodents. You know, maybe arguably uh, these one to two relationships suggest that there's also you know quite you know some 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 functional changes within the rodent, it's maybe not ideal to use mice as a model for, uh, for diabetes. Now, there's also some practical consideration. Maybe your favorite uh, uh, model species, the one where you already invested all of the technology and uh, infrastructure into. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, where you have some choices, um, it, it makes sense to try to, to see which part, which aspect are conserved. And I think the trend is towards more model species uh, because of the tools that we have, be it, you know at the molecular level, they are um, they are they're, they're getting uh, to be uh, you know they make it a little bit easier to establish new model species. Um, okay, I I see there's a question here about uh, I'm gonna take um, you know, this uh, this first question if protein K duplicates into K and L, which uh, what determines which will remain as protein K and which pro is protein L? Is it arbitrary? Yeah, so indeed it's entirely arbitrary. In this case, we just uh, have two copies and we call one K and one L, uh, but we could call, uh, call them alpha, beta, one, two, three, et cetera. Now, in terms of uh, how the function evolves, so hold that thought, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to have something about, about that aspect. Um, we'll refine this. And then the, um, the other question, would it be right to say that orthologs would be best suited uh, for study of, uh, say, arboviruses? Uh, I think that's a too general question for me to say, to answer. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, what do you mean by study arboviruses? I mean, we need to, uh, to look a little bit more uh, specifically about which question you're trying to tackle there. Um, Okay, so, okay, and one more question. What if we're looking at pathways involving a group of genes rather than a single gene protein? Yeah, okay, we're going to talk about, um, about group-wise ortology, but maybe that's not what you mean. What you mean is, uh, yeah, so, I mean, here, if you want to see what is best conserved, indeed, you may want to have a, a broad of you looking at the whole pathway and seeing, for all of the member of a pathway that you know in a particular uh, species, how many of them are conserved. And that, that would be like 
you know, can you find an ortholog for each one of them? And then, you know, maybe that's the, the whole pathway is conserved. Or in some cases, you may, uh, you may see, um, uh, you know, some, only some parts are well conserved and other are not, in which case you may get a little bit nervous about, about doing some inference about the pathway in general. There's also the technique of phallogenic profiling, which um, we, um, you know, which is relevant there uh, is the, the notion that um, uh, parts of the same pathway, they tend to be kept and lost uh, in a correlated manner. So this is also, this is more like an application of ortology. I mean, you could say this is something I could have added to that slide. If you're interested to identify uh, genes that are part of the same pathway, you, you could also look at what are the genes that tend to be uh, to have orthologs in the same species in a correlated way and where, which one are the ones that then when you have one copy that is lost or that get duplicated, you know, the other ones also get lost or duplicated. So um, that's also something that is maybe uh, giving a broader view than just a single gene at a time. And I see one more question here in comparative ana analysis when searching for a gene in a genome using a tool such as BLAST, how can you be sure that you're returning an orthologous or probably, okay, hold that thought. We're going to look at the, the inference now. We need to move forward uh, to cover that part. So that's a good question, but just a little bit too soon. So here I want, this is maybe relevant also to the question about, you know, K and L, how you decide which copy. There sometimes orthology is a little bit misused. Um, so, okay, the first case is, you know, I did mention that it's, it could be indicative of um, having the same function. One, one aspect also to keep in mind, and you could see this in the tree, is that between two species, the orthologs are also the most closely related sequences. So they had the, the, the least time to uh, diverge functionally because they were the same gene in the last common ancestor by definition, right? If you just go back to the last uh, organism, uh, the last, uh, yeah, common ancestor, all of the orthologs were then, you know, mapped back to the same gene. So at that point, they are the same thing. And it's only then that they start diverging, whereas the parallel, they start diverging earlier. Um, however, this is not part of the, of the definition. So don't say that these are orthologous genes, if you mean these are two genes that have the same function. Uh, say, say, use a different word for that. I mean, sometimes people have used, I mean, there's not really a good word that has stuck. I, I prepared this slide many years ago, and I can't say that there's been much improvement in the literature in terms of having a word to define genes with the, have the, which have the same function. Maybe you should just use a paraphrase for that. Maybe isofunctional homologs or equivalogs. But still, you know, the isofunctional homologs, this also requires your uh, two copies to be also homologous, which is, you know, come uh, that have a, they have a common ancestry. If you have two genes that converge to the same function, uh, but are not related, you wouldn't want to call them isofunctional homologs. Equivalents has been used, but I just want, the, the, the bottom line here is that although orthology, which is entirely based on, it's an evolutionary definition, may tell you something about function, it's not defined in that way. Okay, so don't use orthology to mean genes that have the same function. And then the other thing also that relates a bit, perhaps a little bit to the question is that quite often when, if you think about the, the process of duplication, you may have a, a tandem duplication, you know, perhaps through uh, slippage during replication, or you may have retro copies that are, you know, that are copied somewhere else. Uh, or you, you know, or you may have some rearrangements, um, but you may have some situation where you, you think, well, actually there's one copy that is in its ancestral locus. Like this is what I've tried to, to convey here. Imagine in the ancestor, you have red, black, yellow, and then you have on one side, okay, you, you remain in the red, black, yellow order. And here you have a duplication, but it's really that black gene that goes and gets copied somewhere else in the genome. You might be tempted to say that you know, that copy, for instance, you know, the two copies that are synthetic, that are in the same context, that are more orthologous than these two copies, but actually orthology has no, um, 
in itself, there's no implication about uh, about positions and about uh, these asymmetry. Like which one is the original copy and which one is the new copy? No, both are uh, would be called orthologous to that black gene here. You know, the following the duplication. So if you want to be more restrictive, then you could say, for instance, uh, positional uh, orthologs. Okay, so if you do positional ortholog, here it will be, you know, of that black gene here in this species will be that, that, that ortholog. And this ortholog will not be positional, not synthetic. Okay. Um, CA, there was another question about whether there's a publication that could uh, guide the points um, I'm, that I made about genes in similar pathway having uh, correlated orthologs. Yes, I'm going to send, remind, I mean, I will we'll, we'll make sure to add this question to Google Docs and we will, uh, we will make sure that this is answered. But uh, yeah, Pellegrini 1999 is the, the reference that springs to mind and there's been many since then. Okay, so now inferring ortology. Um, so, uh, how, yeah, so now that was the question, uh, how do we now find these orthologs? So there are two main classes of method. Okay, I have to say the you know, this, this has been the classical way of, of teaching ortology and of classifying ortology in, in, the, in the literature. But as years go by, you know, I'm questioning more and more, uh, you know, how helpful this, this distinction is in practice, because most method these days, they kind of mix up a little bit these two concepts. But let's say for didactic purposes, uh, it may still be helpful to think of this as two distinct ways. And so I'm going to handle them now. So one approach is I'll call them graph-based pairwise approaches. And then there's one that is based on trees. And so we learned all about trees earlier today. So we're gonna put this knowledge into practice. Um, so let's start. And for now, just view this as little pictures, but we are going to get uh, to get back to these. So pairwise approaches, they are based on this observation, which I just made a few minutes earlier, that if you're looking at two um, species here, a fish and a human, and again, you know, this is a, a, a very simple case of an ancestral duplication. And then you have two copies in the common ancestor of the fish and human and which give rise to, to well, and the, which are retained then in the present day genomes. So remember, which one are the paralogs and which one are the, the ortholog? Uh, if you could leave a message in the chat, if you like, X1, X2, Y1, Y2, please give me a pair of ortholog or a pair of paralogs. Um, but the, the, the key point here is that the ortholog for instance, okay, no one's typing anything in the in the chat, but I'm I'm sure that most of you following here um, remember the definition I mentioned that of these four genes, like the pairs of orthologs, are the ones that start diverging through a speciation event. So, for instance, exactly X1, Y1, or X2, Y2. These are the orthologs. You note that they have less divergence, they are closer in terms of the distance on the tree than any pair of parallel, which requires us to go back all the way to the duplication event. So we have kind of that distance uh, and that distance extra. So this means, you know, the closer genes, they usually, uh, yeah, sorry, that the, the orthologs are closer than the parallels. Okay, this is just when you're comparing two different species. So that's why people are using this, this uh, BLAST approach that was uh, mentioned in the earlier, you know, in, in, the, um, in the message uh, in the chat from Eliza Ramos. It's because if you start, for instance, with X1 and you look at, you do a BLAST in the human, um, well, Y1, chances are, will give you a better score than Y2 because it is a little bit closer, okay? Closer genes, they usually have higher alignment scores. And so the top hit is likely to be an ortholog. Now this can fail sometimes. Imagine if you start from X1 
and somehow in your database, uh, well, maybe Y1 in, in the, yeah, Y1 was lost, maybe there's a loss. Then the closest one is going to be Y2. So you're going to make a mistake. So this is why also as, a, as an extra requirement, there's often the symmetry that is required. So X1 is closest to Y1, but then Y1, the closest uh, entry in X is also X1. So now you have what is referred to as bidirectional best hits or reciprocal best hits. It's very commonly used to try to find some orthologs between two species. Okay. Um, what I will say also, yeah, so, um, no, any question uh, about bidirectional best hits? Does it make sense? Okay, so the, yeah, you can feel free to type the question, uh, but I'm already going to, to be moving um, to, uh, you know, to, to some improvements. So there are some limitations with this. First thing is that, you know, the score, um, the blast score, that's all nice, but the problem with the blast score is that it really depends on the length of the of your match, if you double the length of the the sequence, you you typically uh, will, will will roughly double the the score. Um, so, uh, for instance, if you're comparing fragments of genes, you know that will fail usually quite badly if you use just uh, blast. And so, what was introduced very early on is the idea of reciprocal smallest distance. Okay, so if you have now if you compute an evolution distance, you know, per particular number of, for instance, substitution per site, um, that, that could be used. That's, uh, that was uh, introduced by, uh, by uh, Wall et al. in 2003. Um, you, you may also, okay, one thing also to note here, I have a bit of a more complex scenario. Well, this is very much a scenario, it's a bit more abstract, but it's a scenario we have uh, seen where we have Remember the human gene that was orthologous to every genes in the rodents? This is basically a, another depiction of that. So we have a first a speciation event, then a duplication, followed by two, um, uh, by, by, by the speciation. And then in this case, the problem is that, you remember the, the, with BBH, you're only taking the top hit. So A, even though it's, it's orthologous to B1 and to C1 or to B2 and to C2, it's actually orthologous to all of these guys. Um, when you're comparing with your genome, you're only going to pick one of the two, the one that has a marginally higher score perhaps because there's been a few, you know, fewer substitution in one of the two copies. Uh, and so you're going to miss out on uh, non one-to-one -one orthology and one-to-many orthology BBH is going to fail. So there are some methods and we've developed one in OMA with OMA, but there are others that address this issue and try to, um, to capture also these one-to-many relationships. You may also want to take into account the uncertainty in your distance estimates. I see also there's a question about that in the chat. I mean, what do we mean by distance? And so there is, yeah, again, you need a model of evolution and the distance is typically going to be computed in uh, average number of substitution per site. Uh, but uh, again, you know, this is, uh, this is uh, you know, the model could be more or less sophisticated. However, this will have the nice property that it's not, you know, the distance, the expected distance is going to be the same whether you're looking at half of the sequence or the whole sequence. So it's a little bit more robust to this variation in sequence, um, sequence length, and particularly when you're working with low quality genomes that tend to have uh, much shorter, uh, you know, fragments, or, or sometimes if you're looking at different isoforms, uh, and, 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 you know, in some cases you, you have fewer or more exons that are shared across the different species, the, the different protein sequence that you are comparing across different species, there you will be a little bit more robust with the distance approach. Uh, rather than just taking like, you know, uh, alignment scores. Um, yeah, and then finally, there's, you know, the, the last point, the last refinement, and this is something that we did, so we're particularly proud uh, to uh, mention this in lectures. I mean, how essential this is, I mean, I think, again, you know, this will depend on 
on how often this scenario occur. But a differential gene loss is a case where you have first a duplication and then, well, actually, maybe let me get back to that example here. Um, and then in this copy, in the, in the fish copy, you lose one, you lose one, and then in the, in, the, in the human, you lose the other. So now you, for instance, only left with X2 and Y1. And there, even with a bidirectional best hit, you're going to fail. You're going to, uh, these are going to look like the mutually closest uh, copy, because, simply because you've lost the other ones. And, and in this case, and this can happen actually after whole genome duplication, where you often have, you know, you lose one copy or the other on some of the branches, and there's a reduction uh, in many uh, pathways to just one copy. And that could be a differential gene loss. And so there's been some extension, and we've introduced one where we then take a, you know, compare this scenario to a third species, which may, which will have hopefully retained both copies and which can act as a witness of non-ortology. I mean, we've got some reference for that, but, you know, for the purpose of this presentation, we're not going to go into details. It's just to say that there's been some, quite a few refinement and, you know, you probably shouldn't use just DDH. Uh, there are better approaches these days to infer ortology that will take these things into account. This is going to be revisited in quite some detail in the tutorial this afternoon. Um, now, a few caveats. Uh, and actually the main caveat, which is a little bit like the question we had also about distance method for trees, is, uh, is then how do you get from a pair to, uh, to more than, than one? And we're going to see this is a real challenge. Um, but I do, before I, we get to this group-wise ortology, I do want to talk about tree-based methods. This is also very useful. This is so this other paradigm to infer ortology. And there the idea, and actually this is the, you know, probably the most elegant method is the species overlap approach, uh, which is very, very simple, but very effective. Um, and so let me show you how it works. Let's say you've built this tree. This is a gene tree now. So this is why, you know, you may have two copy of the frog, two copy of gorilla, two copy of human. Okay. And this is your tree and you, You've done, you've used a good methods, parsimony, likelihoods, distance, they all give you a consistent tree. Somehow you've even managed to root that tree. Okay, the, this is important. The rooting is important for this approach. So that, that's already, here's already a weakness of the approach that it needs a rooting. Okay, but okay, let's say that you've got a rooting. Let's say that midpoint rooting here worked and it is quite reliable. Now the, the approach here is like, can we now infer what are the duplication and what are the speciation mode. Because remember in my introductory slide, if we can mark every internal node as duplication or speciation, we're done. We could just now take any pair of uh, genes and we will, um, we will figure out whether uh, it's an ortholog or a parallel, right? So, um, sorry, yeah, so, so if we just have to find duplication nodes, I mean, you can look at this scenario and ask, okay, is there like, is, does anyone um, can make a guess uh, of like one, if we take the tree at face value of one internal node that is very likely to be a duplication? I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little hint here, you know, look, concentrate on that part of the tree. You see these two frog genes. Okay, you, we see here we've got two frog genes, uh, quite closely related. You know how could this be a speciation node? It doesn't make any sense. To think that we would have a speciation node that relates two genes that are inside the same species, right? So here, for instance, the fact that we have a duplication inside the frog is telling us this is this must be a a duplication node, okay, because you know, of this overlap in the species here. But we can take that a bit further, you know, we can look at, for instance, you know, here you see, uh, yeah, for instance, here the gorilla, oh, the human, yeah, the human, you see, we have a human gene on this side and a human gene on that side. So surely this is not a speciation event. Okay, so we're gonna tag this as a duplication event. And actually we have one more. I see here these two gorilla uh, genes. This is indicating to me 
So this got to be a duplication event. So we can already tag, you know, three of these internal nodes as duplication event. Now, is this a duplication event or a speciation event? Hard to tell, you know, we've got frog genes on one side, then um, gorilla and human, that could well be a speciation, that could well be the speciation between uh, the amphibians. Um, you know, I mean, you know, within the vertebrates between the amphibians and, uh, you know, maybe the, the, the mammals. Uh, but it could also be a, a duplication followed by some losses. However, you notice what I did here, the reason I'm thinking this is probably a speciation node is I'm using my knowledge of biology about the, the, about the, um, the relationship between these species. So far with species overlap, I didn't take that information into account. I was just looking for nodes that are, that have, that are connecting two subtrees which contain the same species left and right. That was enough to tag these three nodes. Here I'm not tagging it because, but I'm using some extra information. So that's actually the other approach. This is actually, by the way, the species overlap is much more recent than the, the classical gene species, species tree reconciliation, where you also, a bit like what I did here, try to use your knowledge of, your, of the species tree to uh, do the, um, to infer the duplication node in the species tree, uh, in the in the gene tree. So, for instance, here, if I do reconciliation, you can see here I cannot I cannot use species overlap. There's no overlap. There's only one gene in each of these uh, species. However, I know that gorilla and human, in terms of the species tree, are together. So the only way this could be the correct tree is if you had a duplication here way before the duplicate the speciation between the amphibian and then the you know the other the other um, you know the mammals or their common ancestor and then you have a loss you've got loss in the in the frog and loss in the human and on this side you've got a loss in the gorilla here okay but that's how you do the reconciliation. So this is in a way taking into account more information. It's taking, you need a model of the species tree and then you reconcile the species tree and the gene tree. What do I mean with loss? Well, genes can duplicate and they can get lost. We saw this was the first, the first scenario. If you duplicate and you're, you don't, you're not really useful or maybe even detrimental in some cases, this duplication is gonna be wiped out. Maybe it's going to be retained in some of the species, but then it's wiped out later. Okay, so, uh, you know, here, this is one scenario. Another scenario is that, you know, you lose one of these frog genes, that's possible. And if, you if, it, if you're looking at a gene family, which has a lot of duplication and losses, you might end up with a very sparse tree. And I'm going to skip the slide here on, on, on a simple algorithm to do the reconciliation. If you're interested, uh, you know, you'll have access to the slides. You could go and have a, or, you know, also ask me uh, this question on the Google Doc and we'll make sure to, to add the reference at the end. Um, this is a, a description of a method to do this reconciliation. It's actually, it looks a bit daunting here, but it's a very simple idea. Okay, just a few caveats, because I do want to spend a bit of time also telling you about groups. Okay, so a um, few caveats about tree-based methods. We've already seen one, uh, that was the routing, but okay, of course the tree accuracy can be challenging. You know how, how difficult um, species tree um, inferences. I mean, I mentioned to you, there's many parts of the tree of life that are still hotly contended. And now you can imagine with the gene tree, you have so much less information to infer these trees. And, and because of deep duplication, they might also encompass even like a longer evolutionary time range. So it's even much harder to, to infer a gene tree than a species tree usually in terms of the amount of information that you can take into account. Um, and you see this tree-based appro approach, they, um, they, you know, will most of them at least uh, will not take uh, into account the, the, the quality of the, of the gene tree. 
again, you know, I mentioned these caveats, but there are ways to overcome most of these things if you're aware of that. The routing uh, could be tricky. Uh, now, this gives me also the opportunity of mentioning a new, a, another routing technique, which is that maybe you could use the number of implied duplication and loss as a routing criteria. There's been some papers trying to do that. So in other words, you could test more different routings and see which one looks like is more, most likely. Uh, so that may be a way also. So consider multiple routings and then pick the one that seems most likely. But it is clear that both the species overlap and the tree reconciliation uh, technique that I, we just saw both depend on the accurate routing. Um, and there's an issue also about error propagation. I mean, uh, you know, if you, you may have like one really, you know, or, yeah, one or two really bad sequence, sometimes they're called road taxa, that, um, you know, that are hard to place in your tree and kind of ruin it for everyone else because that will force you to introduce a duplication node quite deep in the tree and that has to be fixed through lots of losses, et cetera. And so there's a risk also, in if you're, you know, if you're comparing, let's say, 10 different genomes, and one of them is of very bad quality, that this might affect tree-based methods, you know, which are trying to build a global picture for all of the species more than if you are using a graph-based approach. Okay. And if you are interested a little bit more about this different technique, I mean, we have a book chapter that is referenced in the material. And there's also a lot of work that uh, went into uh, trying to compare these different approaches in different data sets, benchmarking, uh, uh, you know, benchmarking would be a topic for a whole course. Uh, so I'm not even gonna attempt to, uh, to, 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 um, to, to say anything about, about benchmark here other than you know, that's maybe something, if you're interested in the, these different approaches, it's probably something that you, you, you could be looking into. Uh, happy to give you some uh, references too. Uh, and yeah, trees, tree methods, they tend to be also a little bit more um, computationally demanding than the graph-based approach. Now, you know, I, I have quite a few points here, but it does, I'm not saying that, you know, the tree-based approach are necessarily going to be worse than the, than the uh, pairwise approaches. I mean, they do consider more information at the same time. Some tree bed methods are very quick. So, you know, this, I'm giving you like kind of more conceptual uh, challenges and then, you know, the devils in the detail. Okay. Uh, yeah, I see some, uh, some helpful also reference that I provided here um, in the chats. Okay. So one thing I do want to cover uh, before we close, uh, and this is really quite critical, is, you know, how do you go from pairwise orthology to kind of groupwise orthology? Usually we don't want, you know, the, the times where we just compare human and mouse or human and C. elegans, or, you know, just two species at a time, um, they are over. I mean, usually most of, I mean, it's, it's, it seems for most application foolish to ignore all of the other genomes that we have to at least uh, to relate, um, you know, different species. So usually we like to look at group-wise orthology, but how to deal with this is actually quite challenging. Um, you know, ideally we, ideally we like to think in terms of classes, in terms of groups. This is the way our mind, especially as biologists, is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is wired. Ideally we would like to have groups of orthologs. And inside your groups, you would have all of the orthologs. You know, every every member of that 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 orthologous group is orthologous to one another, and none of the orthologous uh, pairs are in different groups. Unfortunately, and so that's sometimes in mathematically you would call this an equivalence class, where you know which capture all of the pairwise relationship within a group. The problem is that this is not possible. It's because Orthology is not transitive. What do we mean by non-transitive? We mean that if A is orthologous to B and B is orthologous to C, it does not necessarily follow that A is orthologous to C. You know, and if you don't believe me, I'm going to give you an example here. 
Okay, for instance, on that tree, okay, for instance, you know, we, we, we annotated that tree. Let's say this is complete. So, you know, frog two is ortologous to gorilla two, right? Because this is a speciation event. And gorilla two is ortologous to frog one, but frog one and frog two, they are paralogous, okay? So, you know, how do you group now these sequences in a way such that you capture the orthologous and the, the, the paralogous relationship. And, 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 and this is a fool's errand in, you know, at least not with simple groups, you cannot do that. You are going to either miss out on some orthologous relationship or you are going to include paralogs within the same group. So what do we do? Well, we could go back to our reconcile tree here, slightly different representation, but the stars here are still duplications and the speciation here, I've just drawn it a little bit in a different um, style. Uh, but as I pointed out now several times, if you reconcile a tree, you have related this whole group and you got all of the information. That's wonderful. I guess the challenge there is that sometimes this tree, this reconciled tree could be, you know, even if they are correct, they could be quite messy and complicated to interpret. You see, with just a few species, you start to have like very large trees. Uh, but there are some methods and some, some database that provide that, you know, Ensemble Compara, Panther, Phylum, DB. There are others that provide you with annotated trees. And, and that is still, you know, quite a powerful approach. You can get a lot of information from that. Uh, certainly all of the pairwise relationship, but also more information. You see it all here, the, all these guys here as speciation nodes. So, so this group, you know, they form a very nice, uh, uh, also group of ortholog where you have um, kind of a one-to-one -one relationship between A1, B1, B1, E1, you know. And here you have another, um, another nice subgroup. So that, that carries a lot of information. There's the COGS. I don't know if some of you have come across these. Uh, they are based on the triangle of, uh, of uh, BBH of, well, not exactly BBH, actually it's, it's, it's one directional hit, but it's essentially pairwise matches and they form triangle and they, they build groups. And so you get things like that where, you know, the way it's defined is that inside a, a COG, uh, everything has uh, evolved from a one ancestral speciation event. So you don't know all of the more recent relationships. This is what it implies in terms of the tree. You don't quite know, but you know that at the root you had a speciation uh, node if, if, you know, if the cogs are correctly uh, identified. So that's very good if you're interested in this kind of last common ancestor and they, they are cogs defined for bacteria or for eukaryotes and you know they tell you something about maybe the last common uh, bacterial ancestor or the last common eukaryotic ancestor but they don't tell you so much about the more recent relationships okay there's or to mcl that is also a very common uh, method and the, but the and so that also forms some groups the problem is also again the interpretation these groups, they will not contain all of the ortology. They may also uh, contain some recent paralogs. And so you get some groups, but it's not really quite clear what, you, what is it that you get. Uh, you can think of that as taking this, the, in terms of the gene tree, yeah, if, I don't know if I have this representation, yeah. It's like you cut your gene tree somewhere in the tree. It's not really quite clear where and then you take all of these things together and you know some of them will be ortholog, some will be parallel, but you're not quite clear. I mean, here in this case, it's still quite easy because you have C1, C2, C3, you know, they're all in the same species, you know, they're parallel. But if you had C1, you know, uh, D2 and E3, yeah, it would not be completely obvious which one of the orthologs, which one of the parallel from the grouping. I'm gonna skip this one, but uh, yeah, okay. I want to mention the strict orthologous groups. So you may say, okay, let's forget about capturing all of the orthologous relationship. What we want to do is at least have a group in which I'm sure that any pair inside is orthologous. So I'm going to lose out on some of the, for instance, one to many relationship, but let's just capture a subset such that I only have speciation events. 
And if that is the case, one nice thing is, for instance, I can then build a tree from these sequences. And I'm guaranteed that since these are only speciation events, uh, that, well, I'm not guaranteed, but I think I can expect them to follow the species tree. I mean, I can use them as, as uh, material to infer the species tree. Okay, we, you're, those of you in the, the tutorial, you're going to look at these OMA groups. And then finally, and so this is the, the last concept I wanted to introduce because that's something that is close to our heart, that is not completely trivial, but it's going to be very useful. And I will say upfront, we have a YouTube video that is also introducing this concept. So if after my explanation now, you're still confused, I encourage you to go on YouTube and type in, you know, what are, what are hogs, what are your or clicus groups? I'm sure you will find this video and this is a really, for us, I think this is uh, the most uh, uh, exciting concept if we want to relate multiple genes at the same, at the same time. And here, here's how it works. And if I could just explain this to you and, uh, you know, maybe I'll take, on, take, take uh, some of your questions, but I think it would have been, uh, I would have achieved all of the essential points I wanted to cover this morning. So, um, Consider uh, we're going to go straight to like a real case scenario that uh, I want to use as an example. And uh, so here these are, is the alcohol dehydrogenase in human. That is just the first copy ADH1, which is itself in three copies. So this is a family, you know, the, the enzyme that turns alcohol into aldehyde is a very broadly used um, uh, gene in, in, in uh, a highly duplicated gene um, across all of the tree of life. And so we have these three copies in the human. And so you might say, you know, you sequence the chain and there, let's say through BBH and similarity search, you actually find, okay, there are two copies that seem to be quite close and you want to understand the relationships. Okay. In this case, maybe it's fairly straightforward and you have a one-to-one -one relationship. You know, this is maybe your ADH1A copy in the chimp and ADH1B copy, you know, through pairwise ortology. But how about ADH1C? We don't find any counterpart. Okay, maybe it was, it's probably we think at this point it was lost in the chimp, but uh, we want to know more about that. So we need some more species. Okay. So let's go to the baboon. We go to the baboon, there we find four genes that are somewhat related. We can look for the, or, the pairwise ortology again through using the techniques I mentioned earlier. And that is what we get, okay? We have here a one-to-one -one relationship, but here, all these three, they seem to be orthologous to, to ADH1A. That's an actual example, by the way. Now, what is happening here? This is a little bit confusing. Still no trace of ADH1C, and it's starting to get a bit confusing. Maybe let's dare to go a bit deeper in the primate uh, tree of life. We get the marmosets. There's the only two copies. And we look at the orthology and now it gets so messy. You know? And so, you know, even as someone who's taken this course, you may think, okay, what's going on here? You know, I have no idea what happened with, with this, you know, with this uh, in the history of this gene. And that's just a small part. Uh, and that is because your pairwise orthology, even if you infer correctly, doesn't really now give you like the greater context. It doesn't give you like one scenario uh, that captures all of that. So what do we do with the hierarchical orthologous groups? Well, okay, what we could do, if we take, for instance, now these strict orthologs that I mentioned, you, maybe you take clusters of one-to-one -one orthologs, that simplifies a lot the picture. You can at least do a group with these three sequences and another group with these two. Okay, well, let's do these two groups. That's nice. It's much, much more simple, but you lose a lot of information. You know, all of these genes all of these misfits, you know, they're, they're not part of this. Simple, but too incomplete. So what do we do with the, the, the hogs? What we do is we go back to key ancestors. We're going to now go, and it's nice because it ties our, both our species tree with the gene tree. So we're back to the species tree here, where we have the pri ancestral primate, then the marmoset on one side, then the simian, and here I don't even try to, to resolve that, that node. So it's not a binary tree, it's uh, here we have uh, a polytony. 
But in any case, let's try to have a model for the ancestral simian. And maybe through our pairwise comparison, we can infer that there were really three genes already in the ancestral simian. So there are three groups and we can assign them to these groups. You know, all of the, the, um, the orange genes here, they've all descended from that ancestral copy. The green one has descended from that green copy and these three blue ones have descended from that uh, blue copy. And so in a way, human is a very good representative of, the, of a simian because it's just kept the, these three ancestral genes. But the baboon, this is why things were confusing because it's lost one copy and you, know, you had further duplication of another copy. Now in viewed in this way, it's much more simple to make sense of what has happened here if we think in terms of these ancestral simian. And, but you can see that we could do now the same exercise at the level of the ancestral primate. Uh, yeah, I just know that you can also then compare, you know, the events that you happen on each branch. Then. And at the level of the ancestral primate, we can see there's, you know, maybe through our pairwise analysis, we may infer that we have one group. So everything descended from one gene. So really in terms of the coloring, everything now at that level is inside the same group. And so you can see how we have now nested groups that are going to correspond to one ancestral gene in all of these key ancestors. And we can play with the resolution. If we want to relate the marmoset, you know, if we want to relate a marmoset gene with a human gene, we have to think of it as in terms of, you know, all of these genes have descended from one ancestral gene. Um, for instance, it's not helpful for the chimp, even though the marmosets and the chimp both have two copies, since they are the result of different duplication, let's not try to relate, you know, you know, and ask which of the pair, you know, is better, which, you know, should we relate 15102 to 39360 or to 41356? Well, they are both orthologous to one another, and we can see they all descended from the ancestral primates, and to the extent that there's a difference between these two genes, this is the result of changes that happen on that branch, which is quite distinct, unless you have some convergence, which is typically not what's happening. Um, that would be distinct from, let's say, any uh, changes that have uh, accumulated between these two genes. So you're not going to learn much. And so it makes sense at that level to lump everything in one group. Okay, so I think I did want to cover this. I'm not telling you how we infer these orthogous, hierarchical orthogous group. You can just take them at face value in uh, resources. Uh, I want to plug in, so I, I, I will have to spend some time on this, but I do want to plug in uh, our method on my browser, if you're, particularly if you're not uh, coming to the, um, to, to the practical this afternoon, you can use this. We have a lot of material online, tutorials, and some more videos and some more explanation in, in case you want to try to use this and you're not part of the, the practical this afternoon. Um, and, um, and we will make the slides available. Uh, some of the material, even if you can't take part in the, in the practical this afternoon, if you're interested in doing this, some of the exercise on your own, get in touch with me um, and uh, we'll try to give you some access to these, some of these exercises and tutorials that can be done in an autonomous way. Um, and I will, I'm going to still stay for a few more minutes to take on some questions, but since we are at the end of the sessions, I do want to first uh, thank you all for participating, uh, for asking lots of questions along the way. It's been really, uh, it's, you know, it's really fun to, uh, to deliver a lecture when uh, there is a bit of uh, interactions. Uh, and, you know, we know it's a challenge when we're doing these things remotely, uh, but I think it's been as, as, as good as I could have hoped for in terms of getting, uh, you know, some of your inputs. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, keep in mind, this is only day one of three days. Uh, tomorrow, you're going to revisit some of these concepts uh, with Rob Waterhouse, who's going to tell you also a little bit more also about another resource um, and which, who will also provide a broader perspective 
about gene evolution and also how to relate it across multiple species. And uh, on the third day, my colleague Marc Robinson Rechavi is going to tell you also about how function evolves and the selection um, uh, across this, this data. And you know, if some of the concepts that you've seen today, they are going to be revisited by my colleagues. And so even if you know, there are some things that are unclear this first, uh, in this first exposition, uh, you will have a chance to consolidate this knowledge. Uh, so I'd like to thank you all at this point, and I'm still uh, staying for a bit longer to take on questions. Of course, with the with the knowledge, you know, for those of you who have to uh, who are taking part in the practicals this afternoon, this is starting at one o'clock sharp. So we all also need a bit of time also for lunch. But I'm going to take uh, now some some question for a bit of time if if you have any. And again, thank you all for your attention. Feel free to leave if you don't have any questions and you, you've got other plans. <laughs>